Hi, I'm Tom Rue, on location at the Kansas City Startup Village, ground zero for Google Fiber. Today we're going to be walking through the village and seeing some of the companies that are taking advantage of this great regional asset that's spurring the entrepreneurial ecosystem here. This is Top of Mind. I'm here with Britton Kovac, ambassador of the Kansas City Startup Village. Britton, thanks for having us in today. Tom, welcome. Um, I'm really anxious to get inside and see all the great stuff that's happening here and, and hopefully see some of the companies that are taking advantage of this wonderful resource here in Kansas City. Absolutely. Let's come on in. Thanks. Tom, welcome to the offices of Leap2, uh, Local Ruckus, Form Zapper, and Rivet Creative here in the Kansas City Startup Village. So all four of those companies are located in this particular home? All four companies are located here. Wow. Yes. That's pretty cool. How did that come to happen? Like, I mean, how are, well, first of all, maybe you can share for the viewers a top of mind. How did this Startup Village even come to exist? So the, the Kansas City Startup Village is an organic grassroots movement. Um, Prior to Google Fiber, there were there was a company here at the intersection of about 45th and State Line. Um, with with the installation of Google Fiber in this first Hanover Heights fiber hood, um, companies started moving into the area and, and renting or purchasing homes. So the the fiber kind of became the excuse, like so for people to come together. Google Fiber was very much a catalyst and a reason why people are moving to the area. Um, back in September. Some, some people started to realize like, hey, there's really something happening here and I, I think this could be a very great opportunity to create a very dense community of startups. Um, it started also with Homes for Hackers. Ben Barrett purchased a home, which, we, which we'll talk about. Um, an opportunity for tech companies to come and live rent-free in Kansas City for three months to get their business off the ground. Now you said it kind of happened organically. I mean, how did that, how did it happen organically? Was it you know, somebody that just had the idea and then it just caught on, it kind of went viral? So there was a company here prior to the installation of Google Fiber. And with, with this being the first fiber hood for fiber, it opened up a lot of opportunities for tech businesses to really um, take advantage of, of the fiber speeds. And conversations started happening, people started meeting each other. And, and before we knew it, there was a couple companies sporadic throughout this uh, small couple block radius and from there the idea was born to create the start Kansas City Startup Village to, to make it something bigger and greater than what anybody could have ever imagined. Well I, I guess I know that it's getting bigger because uh, at the foundation we host these, we these weekly meetings and uh, it seems like the first Startup Village meetings there were maybe I don't know six seven eight people and now it's grown that I think uh, last week there, it felt like there was probably 30, 40 people in the meeting. Absolutely. We're getting bigger and bigger. Um, we, we are, you know, we've started out as a Kansas City startup village uh, and we're even expanding now to become more of a community-wide, Kansas City-wide initiative um, with this just being one of the pockets that's going to build into uh, something great that's happening in Kansas City. Now I also happen to know we are getting some national traction with this and some folks outside the region, maybe from Colorado, are taking some interest A certain Brad Feld. I mean, what can you share with the viewers on that? So Brad Feld, a startup guru, we'll call him, actually purchased a home just about one month ago here in Kansas City. So he put out a call nationwide to entrepreneurs and startups to uh, put in their application for the opportunity to live actually rent free for one year here in Kansas City. That's pretty incredible. Very exciting. So we, we have a team from Boston, uh, a very young team, actually um, early 20s, couple actually teenagers in early 20s that are now living in this home to get their 3D printing company off the ground. So, you know, it's hard uh, to be here and not feel kind of like the organic nature of how this has all come together. And, and you've had a kind of a bird's eye view to this, you know. How's that, how did it unfold and, and, and what do you, what's your sense of how this is happening? Sure, so first of all, it has so much to do with community and um, inclusiveness is a, is a word we use a lot around here because that's really what this community is. You know, it started out as 
uh, one company and it's grown to almost 20 companies now with I think about five houses in the area. And and once somebody comes and visits and, and really sees the, the culture and the community and the innovation going on here, um, the fact that, that one can just hop upstairs or hop across the street and collaborate with another company and maybe ask for um, advice on, you know, maybe a situation that, that they've experienced that, that maybe I haven't, uh, for example, and, and that allows for um, a lot of great collaboration, collaboration I mean, and ideas to form. Um, and really, one, like, you know, as I was saying, once somebody is, is surrounded and, and introduced to this environment and these people, you can't get enough. And I personally don't even have my startup here. I, I work out of my home office or on the road, wherever I am. But I often find myself co-working in and around the village on Kansas City Startup Village initiatives um, because of the cohesiveness and, and the people are just amazing. You oh, just that's can't get great. enough of it. Well, speaking of some of those people, how about if we go take a look at Let's go. what's going on here in the Let's house? see who's here. Great. So, Britton, tell me, like, what's the magic that happens in this room? Tom, welcome to uh, one of our conference rooms here. And this is where all the, all the excitement happens, a lot of the excitement happens. You mentioned that we are being nationally recognized here in the Kansas City Startup Village, but not only that, we're, we've actually had visitors, reporters, journalists, um, and delegates from around the world. Really? So we've had people from over 15 countries in this room just in about the past two months. 15 countries? Yes, Russia, Pakistan, Turkey, Cuba, Mexico, Chile, uh, Japan, Ireland. What's, what's the common theme? I mean, like, why are people from all over the world coming here and sitting at this table? Uh, a large reason is entrepreneurship, for one. Uh, technology is another one. And really, uh, what they want to know how and why um, we're being successful. And, and a lot of it is really the community and the collaboration that, that we talk about. The you dense... Know, I, I wonder, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I wonder, like, what they're coming to see, is that even something that's that can be exported? You know, can they take this sense of community or... I mean, have you given any thought? Do you think it's something that we have like in the water here in, in Kansas City? Or do you think it's something that all these visitors are coming here and seeing and can take home with them? Yes, we've, we've had a lot of um, communication with our friends back in Latin America who are wanting to um, bring something like this to their community as well as Pakistan. Uh, a gentleman who actually is involved with uh, the Global Entrepreneurship Week in Pakistan has um, had, has been in the talks about how can they take this and extend it there. No kidding. Very exciting. You know, on behalf of, you know, with my job at the foundation, I have to be honest, it, it does my heart good to hear other programs that we're involved with kind of cross-pollinating. Yes. So that's kind of cool that they'd, they'd find that connection here. Let's go visit with Mike, the founder of Leap2, and then we'll head downstairs to Local Ruckus. Oh, that'd be great. Thanks. Tom, I want to introduce you to founder and CEO of Leap2, Mike Farmer. Mike, awesome to meet you. And Great to meet you. Thank you for letting us come in and kind of disrupt your morning here a little bit. No problem at all. It's always good to have folks visit us in the village. Mike, can you tell us a little bit about Leap2? Absolutely. So, um, Leap2, we're revolutionizing search. Uh, fundamentally, we believe at tw in 2013 that uh, people should be given the whole answer to a query. So what we're doing is we're actually, first of all, taking people direct to the web when they do a query, and the second is we're providing them with social media context. So if you think about, you know, you're searching, um, let's say it's the eighth inning of a Kansas City Royals baseball game. Currently, when you do that on a Google search or Bing or Yahoo, it'll give you a box score, or take you to a bunch of search lists. What we do with Leap is we take you directly to the website that will have the box score and then we'll also have that social media context which will provide you with all right hey and it, it, what's amazing is we call it the whole answer because somebody may say you know we're up three to nothing we're looking fine another person may say we're up three to nothing bases are loaded right pitchers already thrown over 100 pitches i mean it's just so it's context you're offering context that's around exactly the results right. that's 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 exactly right well apparently you're you're on to something because i've been reading about a certain recent funding event yes so uh, two days ago we announced a seed round 1.6 million um very excited about that so 
this team that uh, I've had that you know has been the you know feet we were featured on the front page of the New York Times about how we went about this working for literally a year and a half and uh, a lot of guys working nights and then you know two two jobs now they're you know still working nights but it's a hundred percent on leap two so we've been able to bring everybody on board and that's awesome it's going great that's a great life cycle would you mind sharing like wh what was the spark what was the idea like how how is it that you come to find yourself leading this incredible startup right now? So this is actually my second run at Search. Uh, previous Search company, um, we took and put voice onto a mobile phone, uh, actually about 18 months before Google would come out with it. Um, actually afforded me the opportunity to meet with Larry and Sergey and everybody at Google when they only had 4,000 employees. So it was at that previous Search company that I actually came across a website that uh, Ray Kurzweil, Kurzweil AI had actually developed. The singularity. The singularity. But what he was doing was actually you would navigate his website with a mind map. So that was the original idea. I was like, wow, this is a whole new way. Go direct to the web, web content, and then navigate. And that's where our, our core thinking has been all along. Uh, we actually yesterday released for the first time, I think, a step into that vision. Uh, it's a much more, on the web, it's a much more visual experience. Uh, if you think about search lists, it's a very engineered experience. You know, it's like going to the, to the library and only going to the card catalog. Alternatively, with Leap 2, it gives you this visual context. Everything comes to you. You can see the connectedness and much like Ray Kurzweil had done with a mind map of navigation of content. That's neat. I, I, I'm always fascinated to understand, you know, how you get to those points. It's, it, to me, it's the story behind the story, you know, because yep. now everybody's paying attention. Yep. You're raising capital. But speaking about that story, you know, what's so, you've raised the capital primarily for, you know, what use and, and kind of what's the next step for Leap 2? So a lot of the work we're going to, we've embraced, we've already started in on it, is looking at how do we bind the context and really increase the relevance of any result. And it's not how does social media affect web results, but it's also about how the web affects social media, how local content, and looking at all that we call it the glue. So we are fundamentally at, at its core developing our own engine right now as we speak. So a lot of heads down work on that. Um, I think we'll build out the team some more and then continue, you know, to just ship product. And, you know, that's been our model all along. It's not always perfect, it's not always right, but get it out there, get in the market see what people say and uh, the, the response on the web and, and you know with the way we're doing dynamics and pulling everything together has been incredible well that's great thank you so much for letting us interrupt Absolutely. you today i don't want to keep you from doing this great work uh, i only wish we had you know 50 more leap twos in the area but with the work that's happening here in the village i think we're well on our way absolutely mike before we run actually um i want to i'm a visual learner and i love the uh the visual appeal that you're Yep. website has so would you mind giving us a quick tour sure. of your of your no website problem. so if you think about see how it all pulls in contextually it navigates it moves dynamically um, there's in huh. at Xerox Park there's probably one of the preeminent studies that everybody references came out I think 15 years ago called information foraging theory and information foraging theory is basically says that people hunt for information or they go navigate and look for information just like they do for looking for food. And there's actually two primary behaviors that happen. One is hunting and actually the other is gathering. And we look at what we're doing as a more gathering experience. And if you think about it, it's, it's much more about discovery. It's much more you know, about serendipity. It's about getting that whole answer. Uh, so a lot of people look at what we do and they said, you know, if I'm I'm going to a new city. Uh, I want to get the vibe. Like, let's try to type. Let's say I'd never been to Memphis. So what Leap Two does is it pulls in visual, pulls in direct to the web. It also pulls in uh, local context as well. In this case, we'll. And you can see here how we dynamically build, and it also brings in news, and and so it gives people the whole answer. While you guys are here, you want to uh, head upstairs and see the server room in the Eagle's Nest? Sure. All right. All right, let's go. Thanks. We got our product manager up there. I'll show you that. Great. Please.
Welcome to the Eagle's Nest. Um, this is where we keep our designer. Um, Travis is actually with Rivet Creative. He uh, he works for us probably 50% of the time, and then he also has several of his own clients that he does design work for. But we kind of let him hang out up amongst the trees, get a little inspiration when he comes in. So. That's pretty cool. I mean, that's part of the collaboration of having so many startups in one space, right? I mean, yeah. he's, he can work on his own company, but yet provide service to your company. Yeah, he does. And he helps out with Local Ruckus. He helps out with Forum Zapper. Um, he helps out with Rocket Fuel Partners across the street. So That's really cool. Yeah, it works great. It works great. So what happens in this space over here? That's where the magic happens, man. Oh, the magic. So, uh... So this is where we kind of have some extra space. Um, our developers will come up here, hang out when it gets a little too loud downstairs. We got room for interns, and uh, and then this is where we take full advantage of Google Fiber. This is also where we did the CNN Anderson Cooper interview. Yes, it is. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So Anderson Cooper has been up here. He has. Anderson Cooper has been in our act. Oh, that's pretty cool. It's, it's quite it's the land. Right <laughs> should have like give him a sharpie and let him you know autograph the wall or something. Right? So we're actually, this guy is running Fiverr, and we are pulling down 8 to 10 million tweets a day, and wow. then housing them on several terabytes of data, and using these machines to come in and crunch that data to help uh, refine formula, um, build algo, determine relevance, authority, a lot of things like that. So this is kind of a numbers cruncher right here. This is the benefit of being in a house that has Google Fiverr. Um, and then we actually, back over here, we have um, a cot where a lot of our developers crash when they've worked too hard. So oh, that's important too, right? Yeah, and it's got leopard skin carpet. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed this is also important. All right, Tom, let's continue on through the home to see uh, the world headquarters of Forum Zapper and Local Ruckus. Great, let's do it. Tom, welcome to the office of Form Zapper. They are helping businesses digitize their uh, paperwork and documents. Very interesting. And yes. I noticed there's a, another company down the hallway there. Down here is a very exciting office. This is the world headquarters of Local Ruckus. They are a uh, new, the newest search platform for searching and sharing local events in the area. Wow. Very That's, exciting. This whole visit has been really exciting. So. Where to next? All right, we're going to go take a walk through the village and head to the Brad Bradfeld home. Oh, great. Thanks. You want to lead on? So, Tom, before we go to the Bradfeld home to visit Hanford, I wanted to bring you by the Homes for Hackers. This is the home that Ben Barrett purchased, and he is allowing individuals and startups from anywhere in the country, uh, of course, there's an application process, but the opportunity to live here rent-free for three months to kind, start their business. It's kind of where it all started, right? This is one of the places where it all started, yeah. Tom, welcome to the Bradfeld Fiber Home. This is going to be the last visit on the tour of the village. Uh, you're going to visit with Handprint, the team out of Boston, Massachusetts, that recently won the one-year uh, stay here at the Fiber House. Oh, this is exciting. Hi, guys. Hi. Alexa, this is Tom Hey, Tom, Alexa. Tom. Hey, Alexa, very nice to meet Great you. Great to meet you, too. Come on in, guys. Thanks for letting us visit today. Of So I'm sitting here with the team of Handprint. Uh, before we get started, how would it be if you guys just went around and introduced yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Alexa, or Rex. Um, I am in charge of kind of operations, business development, PR, uh, and analytics for our software. I'm Mike Demeray. Um, I'm working on the front end, uh, doing a lot of the front end programming, doing design, um, strategy, marketing stuff as well. Alexa and I have a lot of overlap. Yeah. I'm Jack Franzen. Uh, I'm a core programmer. I used to do 3D game development, so I'm working a lot on the back end for this. And Derek Kinesia, um, working on like se server side programming and uh, 
that little machine down there is mine. So <laughs> server. server. That's yeah. what we do. <laughs> you know, Rex or Mike, if you want, like, just give us the story of Handprint and, you know, how you guys all came together and, and find yourself in Kansas City, of all places, from, you know, origins that are on the East Coast. Yeah. So... Mike is probably better off to explain the story a little bit, but um, Mike was the first hacker in Homes for Hackers. Um, so he's been kind of in Kansas City and around the scene since um, October, October, right? Yeah. 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 Um, and so he saw like all of the incredible energy and the passion that was happening in Kansas City. Um, and he and Derek had been working on a side project at the time when he was in Kansas, staying in Homes for Hackers, um, that had turned into Handprint. And so as he was developing out um, this little company with Derek, he realized that this was an amazing place to launch a larger company, which became Handprint. Um, so we came back to Boston for a couple months, organized the rest of this team, um, and brought us back to Kansas City on like a three-day road trip. <laughs> late January, yeah. Yeah, late January. Oh, beautiful time to be yeah. coming into Terrible. the world. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we've been here since like early February, um, but we stayed a little bit further away, maybe like eight blocks away from the KCSV. Um, yeah. So, so what does Handprint do? What are yeah. you looking to do? Yeah, so we are building a consumer front end for 3D printing. Um, so we see 3D printers as these incredibly useful machines that um, will be like a regular household appliance in maybe like three to four years. Um, but the biggest barrier we see to that happening is that um, average people can't use 3D printers in a way that's convenient to them um, because the software now is all really designed for um, like engineer types and professional types and people who really want to sit there and take the time to design 3D models from scratch. Um, so we're building something where people can quickly edit um, these 3D models from either their web browser or their tablets um, and just quickly print them at home, making them as useful as they are built to be. So what was the inspiration for that? I mean, how is it that you find yourself wanting to do that yeah i mean it was it started as uh we just wanted to build a factory that was entirely <laughs> automated from start to finish right oh, really? so this was just the crazy idea um and yeah we were fascinated with 3d printers what they can do cnc machines laser cutters basically the new world of manufacturing um but then we started working with 3d printers and we started looking into how we'd make software to make our yeah. craziest you know idea come true and we realized how hard it really was to um to i guess write software for 3d printers to make something that that worked really well for a lot of use cases um besides just one um so yeah so we decided to i guess we boil down the problem to the to the root um we think that that the software the user interface for the for the end user is really the key part to the whole problem and yeah i guess we just stuck with that so you wanted to find an interface that like didn't require a degree in engineering exactly. right right yeah. you didn't have to come from industry yeah. yeah absolutely yeah. yeah um we're working on that now and i i guess we chose 3d printers um because we we love that they make everything so customizable like you can create things that perfectly fit your own taste to put in your house and yeah. and and things like that. It so really changes what it means yeah. to like to be to in, be alive yeah. right now. Like in the you know, five to six years, you know, when three D printers are gonna be so abundant, it's like everything you own will be designed to, yeah, to it's gonna what be, you actually wanted. Where will the money be made then in three D printing? Is it gonna be you know, the folks that are selling the boxes, is it going to be like, you know, printers now, the money's in the ink cartridges, right? Yeah. So yeah. is it going to be in the... You so know, there's the plastic, the plastic, that you have to buy new plastic all the time for your 3D printer. Um, besides that, we hope the money's in the, in the software and the models. Um, <laughs> but uh, besides that, you know, um, yeah, it, it, it will probably be the plastic. Um, those need to be refilled, you know, the spools need to be refilled every once in a while. Um, well, I, I'm asking the question because yeah. I know you're involved with some folks, uh, Brad Feld in particular, yeah. who knows a thing or two about investing in companies and, <laughs> and making money. And so, <laughs> you know, how how is it that, you know, you've been here before, you were one of the yeah. original hackers yeah. and the yeah. homes he for hackers. the original hacker. Yeah, with, you know, Ben Barreth and his crazy idea that oh, he, he's he got up and said it at one million cups. I remember it well. Um, but how is it now that you're in the, the house that, you know, Brad bought, so to yeah. speak? These are some of the coolest kids I know, some of the smartest kids I know. We decided that this was the idea that we wanted to put our weight behind. Um, we think that it's definitely worth it. Um, this is going to be, it, you know, when we actually get this thing um, 
refined down, polished up, we really think this can change people's lives. It's going to change what it means to literally own a home. Like having a 3D printer can change the way you live. So, um, we, yeah, so we ended up in the Bradfeld house. Um, we'd heard about the competition. Uh, but we weren't sure because we were already in Kansas City. We weren't sure if we wanted to necessarily apply and kind of take that away from somebody who is out of state. Um, and then we realized that we were out of state yeah. <laughs> and we had a lot of encouragement to apply. Um, so it was a great fit for us. Like we were really excited yeah. about the opportunity. Um, a, a little bit last minute uh, because we were working I mean, it's on the entre it's, it's the know, entrepreneurial uh, mindset else, we, of like yeah. how to get things and we, done. And <laughs> we were actually hustling. And, we were trying uh, to get sound print done for, for Big, Big Kansas, Kansas City. City that we did. Oh, yeah. really? Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't um, know if you went to Big Kansas City. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we were, that deadline for sound print was actually around the same day that the Bradfeld app had to get done. So we were Two like... For one. Yeah. Yeah. So it was it was a hectic time period. We, yeah. Um, it was crazy. But <laughs> basically, yeah, you know, we're, we're looking to extend our runway. We thought this was an awesome opportunity. We think Bradfeld is, like, absolutely right. Um, and everything he talks about in startup communities, yeah. we're really inspired. We think that, like, first of all, the, the way he's supporting the KC scene right now is really cool. Um, and, you know, we're just really supportive of that. I don't know... Uh, you know. Well, speaking of the Kansas City scene, and, yeah. and, and Rex, you had mentioned this when we yeah. you know, came through, um, it's not coincidental that this house is physically located here where oh, it no, is, no, no, right? No. right? Because yeah. it was in the first footprint that rolled out the fiber. Of course, fiberhood. So yeah. what's fiber meant to you? So Google Fiber is kind of like the icing on our cake, right? Um, we, we moved to KC more for the community that we found here. Um, we always just like making that distinction because yeah, because um, everyone is like Google Fiber like brings people here, and we're well, like, no, yeah, it's it's great, and it, we we use it like heartily yeah. in our product. Um, but the the best thing to us is like, as an entrepreneur or somebody who's like working on a startup, it's really easy to get dug down in your own little hole of like I'm building my product and I have nobody to like help us see, like from the outside world see right. where we're going or like sometimes you just have to get out of that hole right. um so it's really nice and it keeps us motivated to be able to just walk across the street and talk to local ruckus about something yeah. or just be like guys we need some support here like just so, give yeah. hu let's hug it out so for like a community. couple it's minutes. the community yeah, like, yeah but uh google fiber you know it's changing the way we work you know oh, yeah. we are moving much faster um, besides that, we get to do some cool stuff here that we wouldn't be able to do without some serious money. Um, we're running our test server, like that's our server right there, just like a you know regular old computer, but give it some fiber and it's a serious uh, you know development server. So we're doing that. We're ha also having some fun with web scrapers, they're called. Um, and yeah, we're. Uh, we're actually we're having fun on the fiber. Well, I, I appreciate you, you know, distinguishing you know what the fibers meant and what the yeah. villages meant. You know, you'd mentioned uh, Big KC. Um, you know, we we were a sponsor, and I got to speak at that, and I literally had an epiphany standing on stage there that I shared that, you know, <laughs> uh, that community is a form of currency. Yeah. 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 No. Right. Because yeah. I don't know that you could put a value on the fact that you can walk. I think it's what three houses down. Britain yeah, was like showing us. Down, yeah. You know, yeah. and there's you know there's five awesome startups yeah. jamming away and. You yeah. guys are all collaborating on this stuff. I mean, that really sounds like, or at least what I'm hearing, that that's been a big, big part of this experience. That's, Absolutely. But that's also why we moved to Kansas City. Um, it's really easy for a startup in a new city to get lost in the woodwork, and we knew that moving to Kansas City we wouldn't, uh, which is a, it's a safety net for us, I guess, but it's, it's like everything that <laughs> makes our startup win. You know, Mike, I think you were kind of the, the leader to coax these three to come from the East I Coast did, in. yeah. What was that experience like? Um, so yeah, I mean, I was here, uh, as, as we talked about before, I was in the Homes for Hackers program. I saw this awesome opportunity and, you know, we, we were talking, Derek and I were talking about taking, you know, the project we were working on to the next level. Um, and we had a few cities in mind where we wanted to move to, but KC just quickly moved up the list. Um, you know, we wanted to go to a place where we didn't have to you know, spend months trying to get into the networking scene, trying to figure out, you know, who to talk to, um, all of these things. So basically, yeah, we, I, it was down to just a few choices. It was like three choices in the, in the end, but really Casey was, was, Casey was always like, the yeah, it was the absolutely. And that was, that was cool with you guys. Like, you know, you didn't, you weren't like, geez, KC, really? <laughs> Uh, no, as a nerd, I thought the Google Fiber would be really cool, so <laughs> it's definitely an incentive for me. Yeah, yeah. 
and I pretty much was done with school, done with what I was doing, so a change would have been nice. Good for you. Yeah. Well, to clarify, he was still in school, but he was mentally yeah, done, was with mentally done with school. <laughs> yeah. Trust me, I got a son about your age, and I, I know exactly he's at the same stage right now. I'm the, actually the only college graduate of the group. Um, so I was kind of looking for a startup to be a part of. Um, I knew that I wanted to join a startup as soon as I graduated. It's the only place I've ever felt like passionate about anything that I'm doing. Um, and I've known Mike for two or three years now, and, and I trust like everything he does. Um, and this was the best idea I'd heard in a really long time. Uh, so I, I backed the idea completely, and I, I met Derek and backed the team, and so I joined, and now we're here. <laughs> You know, Rex, you just used the word trust, and you know, I get a chance to interview entrepreneurs um, all over the world, frankly, and you know, you hear them in, in kind of the dynamics of founding teams that come together. You know, how important is that trust factor? Was it like was that first, or was it like you looked at the business plan and said, "Geez, this handprint thing is kind of cool. I can I can jump into that." No, it was absolutely first. Um, in a startup, the business plan changes every 10 minutes. Like, you have a conversation, and you're like, okay, changing that. Like, let's go into the document Whoa. and change it. Yeah. Like, well, yeah. Um, so you just have to trust that your co-founders are going to make the right decisions, and we can't function on a daily basis if I can't trust them to do their jobs. Yeah. Now, does that mean you always have to all be in agreement on decisions? No. No. <laughs> no. But we tend to be. I mean, it's... We, we yeah. fight a lot when it comes to important decisions, and we always agree on the end result. Well, guys, thanks so much for letting us visit today. It was today. a pleasure. You know, it's, it's clear you're just like one of several really exciting things that are happening here. <laughs> We're thrilled that you have the community to draw from. And, you know, I'm looking forward to great things coming out of, you know, Handprint and the Brad Fell House. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you.